coach was so nearly empty that the little boy had a seat all to himself, and his mother sat across the aisle on the seat next to the little boy's sister, a baby with a piece of toast in one hand and a rattle in the other. She was strapped securely to the seat so she could sit up and look around, and whenever she began to slip slowly sideways, the strap caught her and held her halfway until her mother turned around and straightened her again. The little boy was looking out the window and eating a cookie, and the mother was reading quietly, answering the little boy's questions without looking up. We're on a river, the little boy said. This is a river, and we're on it. Fine, his mother said. We're on a bridge over a river, the little boy said to himself. The few other people in the coach were sitting at the other end of the car. If any of them had occasion to come down the aisle, the little boy would look around and say, Hi! And the stranger would usually say hi back and sometimes ask the little boy if he were enjoying the train ride, or even tell him he was a fine, big fellow. These comments annoyed the little boy, and he would turn irritably back to the window. There's a cow, he would say, or sighing. How far do we have to go? Not much longer now, his mother said each time. Once the baby, who was very quiet and busy with her rattle and her toast, which the mother would renew constantly, fell over too far sideways and banged her head. She began to cry, and for a minute there was noise and movement around the mother's seat. The little boy slid down from his own seat and ran across the aisle to pet his sister's feet and beg her not to cry, and finally the baby laughed and went back to her toast, and the little boy received a lollipop from his mother and went back to the window. I saw a witch, he said to his mother after a minute. There was a big old ugly old bad old witch outside. Fine, his mother said. A big old ugly witch, and I told her to go away, and she went away, the little boy went on in a quiet narrative to himself. She came and she said, I'm going to eat you up. And I said, no, you're not. And I chased her away, the bad old mean witch. He stopped talking and looked up as the outside door of the coach opened and a man came in. He was an elderly man with a pleasant face under white hair. His blue suit was only faintly touched by the disarray that comes from a long train trip. He was carrying a cigar, and when the little boy said, Hi! The man gestured at him with the cigar and said, Hello yourself, son. He stopped just beside the little boy's seat and leaned against the back, looking down at the little boy, who craned his neck to look upward. What are you looking for out that window? The man asked. Witches, the little boy said promptly. Bad old mean witches. I see, the man said. Find many? My father smokes cigars, the little boy said. All men smoke cigars, the man said. Someday you'll smoke a cigar too. I'm a man already, the little boy said. How old are you, the man asked. The little boy, at the eternal question, looked at the man suspiciously for a minute and then said, 26, 848. His mother lifted her head from the book. Four, she said, smiling fondly at the little boy. Is that so? The man said politely to the little boy. Twenty-six. He nodded his head at the mother across the aisle. Is that your mother? The little boy leaned forward to look and then said, Yes, that's her. What's your name? The man asked. The little boy looked suspicious again. Mr. Jesus, he said. Johnny, the little boy's mother said. She caught the little boy's eye and frowned deeply. That's my sister over there, the little boy said to the man. She's twelve and a half. Do you love your sister? The man asked. The little boy stared, and the man came around the side of the seat and sat down next to the little boy. Listen, the man said. Shall I tell you about my little sister? The mother, who had looked up anxiously when the man sat down next to her little boy, went peacefully back to her book. Tell me about your sister, the little boy said. Was she a witch? Maybe, the man said. The little boy laughed excitedly, and the man leaned back and puffed at his cigar. Once upon a time, he began, I had a little sister, just like yours. The little boy looked up at the man, nodding at every word. My little sister, the man went on, was so pretty and so nice that I loved her more than anything else in the world. So shall I tell you what I did? The little boy nodded more vehemently, and the mother lifted her eyes from her book and smiled, listening. I bought her a rocking horse and a doll and a million lollipops, the man said. And then I took her and I put my hands around her neck and I pinched her and pinched her until she was dead. The little boy gasped 
and the mother turned around, her smile fading. She opened her mouth and then closed it again as the man went on. And then I took and I cut her head off and I took her head. Did you cut her all in pieces? The little boy asked breathlessly. I cut off her head and her hands and her feet and her hair and her nose, the man said. And I hit her with a stick and I killed her. Wait a minute, the mother said, but the baby fell over sideways just at that minute. And by the time the mother had set her up again, the man was going on. And I took her head and I pulled out all her hair and your little sister, the little boy prompted eagerly. My little sister, the man said firmly. And I put her head in a cage of the bear and the bear ate it all up. Ate her head all up? The little boy asked. The mother put her book down and came across the aisle. She stood next to the man and said, Just what do you think you're doing? The man looked up courteously and she said, Get out of here! Did I frighten you? The man said. He looked down at the little boy and nudged him with an elbow, and he and the little boy laughed. This man cut up his little sister, the little boy said to his mother. I can very easily call the conductor, the mother said to the man. The conductor will eat my mommy, the little boy said. We'll chop her head off, too. And little sister's head, too, the man said. He stood up, and the mother stood back to let him get out of the seat. Don't ever come back in this car, she said. My mommy will eat you, the little boy said to the man. The man laughed, and the little boy laughed, and then the man said, Excuse me, to the mother, and went past her out of the car. When the door had closed behind him, the little boy said, How much longer do we have to stay on this old train? Not much longer, the mother said. She stood looking at the little boy, wanting to say something. And finally she said, You sit still and be a good boy. You may have another lollipop. The little boy climbed down eagerly and followed his mother back to her seat. She took a lollipop from a bag in her pocketbook and gave it to him. What do you say? she asked. Thank you, the little boy said. Did that man really cut his little sister up in pieces? He was just teasing, the mother said, and added urgently, just teasing. Probably, the little boy said. With his lollipop, he went back to his own seat and settled himself to look out the window again. Probably, he was a witch. The day my son Lori started kindergarten, he renounced corduroy overalls with bibs and began wearing blue jeans with a belt. I watched him go off the first morning with the older girl next door, seeing clearly that an era of my life was ended. My sweet-voiced nursery school taught, replaced by a long-trousered, swaggering character who forgot to stop at the corner and wave goodbye to me. He came home the same way, the front door slamming open, his cap on the floor, and the voice suddenly became raucous, shouting, Isn't anybody here? At lunch, he spoke insolently to his father, spilled his baby sister's milk, and remarked that his teacher said we were not to take the name of the Lord in vain. How was school today, I asked, elaborately casual. All right, he said. Did you learn anything, his father asked. Laurie regarded his father coldly. I didn't learn nothing, he said. Anything, I said. Didn't learn anything. The teacher spanked a boy, though, Laurie said, addressing his bread and butter. For being fresh, he added, with his mouth full. What did he do, I asked. Who was it? Lori thought. It was Charles, he said. He was fresh. The teacher spanked him and made him stand in a corner. He was awfully fresh. And what did he do, I asked again. But Lori slid off to his chair, took a cookie, and left, while his father was still saying, See here, young man. The next day, Lori remarked at lunch, as soon as he sat down, Well, Charles is bad again today, he grinned enormously and said. Today, Charles hit the teacher. Good heavens, I said, mindful of the Lord's name. I suppose he got spanked again? He sure did, Lori said. Look up, he said to his father. What, his father said, looking up. Look down, Lori said. Look at my thumb. Gee, you're dumb. He began to laugh insanely. Why did Charles hit the teacher, I asked quickly. Because she tried to make him color with red crayons, Lori said. Charles wanted to color with green crayons, so he hit the teacher, and she spanked him and said nobody play with Charles, but everybody did. The third day, it was Wednesday of the first week, Charles bounced a seesaw onto the head of a little girl and made her bleed, and the teacher made him stay inside all during recess. 
Thursday, Charles had to stand in a corner during story time because he kept pounding his feet on the floor. Friday, Charles was deprived of blackboard privileges because he threw chalk. On Saturday, I remarked to my husband, do you think kindergarten is too unsettling for Lori? All this toughness and bad grammar and this Charles boy sounds like such a bad influence. It'll be all right, my husband said reassuringly. Bound to be people like Charles in the world. Might as well meet them now as later. On Monday, Lori came home full of news. Charles, he shouted as he came up the hill. I was waiting anxiously on the front steps. Charles, Lori yelled all the way up the hill. Charles is bad again. Come right in, I said as soon as he came close enough. Lunch is waiting. You know what Charles did? He demanded, following me through the door. Charles yelled so in school, they sent a boy in from the first grade to tell the teacher that she had to make Charles keep quiet. And so Charles had to stay after school. And so all the children stayed to watch him. What did he do? I asked. He just sat there, Lori said, climbing into his chair at the table. Hi, Pop, you old dust mop. Charles had to stay after school today, I told my husband. Everyone stayed with him. What does this Charles look like, my husband asked Lori. What's his other name? He's bigger than me, Lori said, and he doesn't have any rubbers and he doesn't wear a jacket. Monday night was the first parent-teacher's meeting, and only the fact that the baby had a cold kept me from going. I wanted passionately to meet Charles' mother. On Tuesday, Lori remarked suddenly, our teacher had a friend come to see her in school today. Charles's mother? My husband and I asked simultaneously. Nah, Lori said scornfully. It was a man who came and made us do exercises. We had to touch our toes. Look, he climbed down from his chair and squatted down and touched his toes. Like this, he said. He got solemnly back into his chair and said, picking up his fort, Charles didn't even do exercises. That's fine, I said heartily. Didn't Charles want to do exercises? Nah, Lori said. Charles is so fresh to the teacher's friend, he wasn't let do exercises. Fresh again, I said. He kicked the teacher's friend, Lori said. The teacher's friend told Charles to touch his toes just like I did, and Charles kicked him. What are they going to do about Charles, do you suppose? Lori's father asked him. Lori shrugged elaborately. Throw him out of school, I guess, he said. Wednesday and Thursday were routine. Charles yelled during story hour and hit a boy in the stomach and made him cry. On Friday, Charles stayed after school again and so did all the other children. With the third week of kindergarten, Charles was an institution in our family. The baby was being a Charles when she cried all afternoon. Flory did a Charles when he filled his wagon full of mud and pulled it through the kitchen. Even my husband, when he caught his elbow in the telephone cord and pulled telephone, ashtray, and a bowl of flowers off the table, said after the first minute, Looks like Charles. During the third and fourth weeks, it looked like a reformation in Charles. Lori reported grimly at lunch on Thursday of the third week, Charles is so good today the teacher gave him an apple. What? I said, and my husband added warily, You mean Charles? Charles, Lori said. He gave the crowns around and he picked up the books afterward and the teacher said he was her helper. What happened? I asked incredulously. He was her helper, that's all, Lori said and shrugged. Can this be true about Charles? I asked my husband that night. Can something like this happen? Wait and see, my husband said cynically. When you've got a Charles to deal with, this may mean he's only plotting. He seemed to be wrong. For over a week, Charles was the teacher's helper. Every day he handed things out and he picked things up. No one had to stay after school. The PTA meetings next week, I told my husband one evening. I'm going to find Charles's mother there. Ask her what happened to Charles, my husband said. I'd like to know. I'd like to know myself, I said. On Friday of that week, things were back to normal. You know what Charles did today? Lori demanded at the lunch table in a voice slightly awed. He told a little girl to say a word, and she said it, and the teacher washed her mouth out with soap, and Charles laughed. What word, his father said unwisely, and Lori said, I'll have to whisper it to you, it's so bad. He got down off his chair and went around to his father. His father bent his head down, and Lori whispered joyfully. His father's eyes widened. Did Charles tell the little girl to say that? 
She said it twice, Lori said. Charles told her to say it twice. What happened to Charles, my husband asked. Nothing, Lori said. He was passing out the crayons. Monday morning, Charles abandoned the little girl and said the evil word himself three or four times, getting his mouth washed out with soap every time. He also threw chalk. My husband came to the door with me that evening as I set out for the PTA meeting. Invite her over for a cup of tea after the meeting, he said. I want to get a look at her. If only she's there, I said prayerfully. She'll be there, my husband said. I don't see how they could hold a PTA meeting without Charles' mother. At the meeting, I sat restlessly, scanning each comfortable matronly face, trying to determine which one hid the secret of Charles. None of them looked to me haggard enough. No one stood up in the meeting and apologized for the way her son had been acting. No one mentioned Charles. After the meeting, I identified and sought out Lori's kindergarten teacher. She had a plate with a cup of tea and a piece of chocolate cake. I had a plate with a cup of tea and a piece of marshmallow cake. We maneuvered up to one another cautiously and smiled. I've been so anxious to meet you, I said. I'm Lori's mother. We're all so interested in Lori, she said. Well, he certainly likes kindergarten, I said. He talks about it all the time. We had a little trouble adjusting the first week or so, she said primly. But now he's a fine little helper. With occasional lapses, of course. Lori usually adjusts very quickly, I said. I suppose this time it's Charles' influence. Charles? Yes, I said, laughing. You must have your hands full in that kindergarten with Charles. Charles? She said. We don't have any Charles in the kindergarten. It was a respectable, well-padded restaurant with a good chef and a group of entertainers who called themselves a floor show. The people who came there laughed quietly and dined thoroughly, appreciating the principle that the check was always a little more than the restaurant and the entertainment and the company warranted. It was a respectable, likable restaurant, and two women could go into it alone with perfect decorum and have a faintly exciting dinner. When Mrs. Wilkins and Mrs. Straw came noiselessly down the carpeted staircase into the restaurant, none of the waiters looked up more than once, quickly. Few of the guests turned, and the head waiter came quietly and bowed agreeably before he turned to the room and the few vacant tables far in the back. Do you mind being so far away from everything, Alice? Mrs. Wilkins, who was hostess, said to Mrs. Straw. We can wait for a table if you like, or go somewhere else. Of course not. Mrs. Straw was a rather large woman in a heavy flowered hat, and she looked affectionately at the substantial dinners set on nearby tables. I don't mind where we sit. This is really lovely. Anywhere will do, Mrs. Wilkins said to the head waiter. Not too far back if you can help it. The head waiter listened carefully and nodded, stepping delicately off between the tables to one very far back, near the doorway where the entertainers came in and out, near the table where the lady who owned the restaurant was sitting drinking beer, near the kitchen doors. Nothing nearer, Mrs. Wilkins said, frowning at the head waiter. The head waiter shrugged, gesturing at the other vacant tables. One was behind a post, another was set for a large party, a third was somehow behind the small orchestra. This will do beautifully, Jen, Mrs. Straw said. Well, sit right down. Mrs. Wilkins hesitated still, but Mrs. Straw pulled out the chair on one side of the table and sat down with a sigh, setting her gloves and pocketbook on the extra chair beside her and reaching to unfasten the collar of her coat. I can't say I like this, Mrs. Wilkins said, sliding into the chair opposite. I'm not sure we can see anything. Of course we can, Mrs. Straw said. We can see all that's going on, and of course we'll be able to hear everything. Would you like to sit here instead, she finished reluctantly. Of course not, Alice, Mrs. Wilkins said. She accepted the menu the waiter was offering her and set it down on the table, scanning it rapidly. The food is quite good here, she said. Shrimp casserole, Mrs. Straw said. Fried chicken, she sighed. I certainly am hungry. Mrs. Wilkins ordered quickly with no debate and then helped Mrs. Straw choose. 
When the waiter had gone, Mrs. Straw leaned back comfortably and turned in her chair to see all of the restaurant. This is a lovely place, she said. The people seem to be very nice, Mrs. Wilkins said. The woman who owns it is sitting over there in back of you. I always thought she looked very clean and decent. She probably makes sure the glasses are washed, Mrs. Straw said. She turned back to the table and picked up her pocketbook, diving deep into it after a pack of cigarettes and a box of wooden safety matches, which she set on the table. I like to see a place that serves food kept nice and clean, she said. They make a lot of money from this place, Mrs. Wilkins said. Tom and I used to come here years ago before they enlarged it. It was very nice then, but it attracts a better class of people now. Mrs. Straw regarded the crab meat cocktail now in front of her with deep satisfaction. Yes, indeed, she said. Mrs. Wilkins picked up her fork indifferently, watching Mrs. Straw. I had a letter from Walter yesterday, she said. What did he have to say, Mrs. Straw asked. He seems fine, Mrs. Wilkins said. Seems like there's a lot he doesn't tell us. Walter's such a good boy, Mrs. Straw said. You worry too much. The orchestra began to play suddenly and violently, and the lights darkened to a spotlight on the stage. Oh, I hate to eat in the dark, Mrs. Wilkins said. We'll get plenty of light back here from those doors, Mrs. Straw said. She put down her fork and turned to watch the orchestra. They've made Walter a proctor, Mrs. Wilkins said. He'll be the first in his class, Mrs. Straw said. Look at the dress on that girl. Mrs. Wilkins turned covertly looking at the girl Mrs. Straw had indicated with her head. The girl had come out of the doorway that led to the entertainer's rooms. She was tall and very dark, with heavy black hair and thick eyebrows, and the dress was electric green satin, cut very low, with a flaming orange flower on one shoulder. I never did see a dress like that, Mrs. Wilkins said. She must be going to dance or something. She's not a very pretty girl, Mrs. Straw said, and look at the fellow with her. Mrs. Wilkins turned again and moved her head back quickly to smile at Mrs. Straw. He looks like a monkey, she said. So little, Mrs. Straw said. I hate those flabby little blonde men. They used to have such a nice floor show here, Mrs. Wilkins said. Music and dancers and sometimes a nice young man who would sing requests from the audience. Once they had an organist, I think. This is our dinner coming along now, Mrs. Straw said. The music had faded down, and the leader of the orchestra, who acted as master of ceremonies, introduced the first number, a pair of ballroom dancers. When the applause started, a tall young man and a tall young woman came out of the entertainer's door and made their way through the tables to the dance floor. On their way, they both gave a nod of recognition to the girl in electric green and the man with her. Aren't they graceful, Mrs. Wilkins said when the dance started. They always look so pretty, that kind of dancers. They have to watch their weight, Mrs. Straw said critically. Look at the figure on the girl in green. Mrs. Wilkins turned again. I hope they're not comedians. They don't look very funny right now, Mrs. Straw said. She estimated the butter left on her plate. Every time I eat a good dinner, she said, I think of Walter and the food we used to get in school. Walter writes that the food is quite good, Mrs. Wilkins said. He's gained something like three pounds. Mrs. Straw raised her eyes. For heaven's sake, what is it? I think he's a ventriloquist, Mrs. Straw said. I do believe he is. They're very popular right now, Mrs. Wilkins said. I haven't seen one since I was a kid, Mrs. Straw said. He's got a little man, what do you call them, in that box there. She continued to watch, her mouth a little open. Look at it, Jen. The girl in green and the man had sat down at a table near the entertainer's door. She was leaning forward, watching the dummy, which was sitting on the man's lap. It was a grotesque wooden copy of the man. Where he was blonde, the dummy was extravagantly yellow-haired with sleek wooden curls and sideburns. Where the man was small and ugly, the dummy was smaller and uglier. With the same wide mouth, the same staring eyes, the horrible parody of evening clothes, complete to tiny black shoes. I wonder how they happen to have a ventriloquist here, Mrs. Wilkins said. 
The girl in green was leaning across the table to the dummy, straightening his tie, fastening one shoe, smoothing the shoulders of his coat. As she leaned back again, the man spoke to her, and she shrugged indifferently. I can't take my eyes off that green dress, Mrs. Straw said. She started as the waiter came softly up to her with the menu, waiting uneasily for their dessert orders, his eye on the stage where the orchestra was finishing a between-acts number. By the time Mrs. Straw had decided on apple pie with chocolate ice cream, the master of ceremonies was introducing the ventriloquist. And Marmaduke, a chip off the old block. I hope it's not very long, Mrs. Wilkins said. We can't hear from here anyway. The ventriloquist and the dummy were sitting in the spotlight, both grinning widely, talking fast. The man's weak, blonde face was close to the dummy's staring grin, their black shoulders against one another. Their conversation was rapid. The audience was laughing affectionately, knowing most of the jokes before the dummy finished speaking, silent with interest for a minute and then laughing again before the words were out. I think he's terrible, Mrs. Wilkins said to Mrs. Straw during one roar of laughter. They're always so coarse. Look at our friend in the green dress, Mrs. Straw said. The girl was leaning forward, following every word, tense and excited. For a minute, the heavy sullenness of her face had vanished. She was laughing with everyone else, her eyes lit. She thinks it's funny, Mrs. Straw said. Mrs. Wilkins drew her shoulders closer together and shivered. She attacked her dish of ice cream. I always wonder, she began after a minute, why places like this, you know, with really good food, never seem to think about desserts. It's always ice cream or something. Nothing better than ice cream, Mrs. Straw said. You'd think they'd have pastries or some nice pudding, Mrs. Wilkins said. And they never seem to give any thought to it. I've never seen anything like that fig and date pudding you make, Jen, Mrs. Straw said. Walter always used to say that was the best, Mrs. Wilkins began, and was cut short by a blare from the orchestra. The ventriloquist and the dummy were bowing, the man bowing deeply from the waist, and the dummy bobbing his head courteously. The orchestra began quickly with a dance tune, and the man and the dummy turned and trotted off the stage. Thank heavens, Mrs. Wilkins said. I haven't seen one of those for years, Mrs. Straw said. The girl in green had risen, waiting for the man and the dummy to come back to the table. The man sat down heavily, the dummy still on his knee, and the girl sat down again on the edge of her chair, asking him something urgently. Well, what do you think? He said loudly without looking at her. He waved to a waiter who hesitated, looking in back of him at the table where the woman who owned the restaurant was sitting alone. After a minute, the waiter approached the man, and the girl said, her voice clear over the soft waltz the orchestra was playing, Don't drink any more, Joey. We'll go somewhere and eat. The man spoke to the waiter, ignoring the girl's hand on his arm. He turned to the dummy, speaking softly, and the dummy's face and broad grin looked at the girl and then back at the man. The girl sat back, looking out of the corners of her eye at the owner of the restaurant. I'd hate to be married to a man like that, Mrs. Straw said. He's certainly not a very good comedian, Mrs. Wilkins said. The girl was leaning forward again, arguing, and the man was talking to the dummy, making the dummy nod in agreement. When the girl put a hand on his shoulder, the man shrugged it away without turning around. The girl's voice rose again. Listen, Joey, she was saying. In a minute, the man said. I just want to have this one drink. Yeah, leave him alone, can't you? The dummy said. You don't need another drink now, Joey, the girl said. Look, honey, I've got a drink ordered. I can't leave before it comes. Why don't you make that old deadhead shut up? The dummy said to the man. Always making a fuss when she sees someone having a good time. Why don't you tell her to shut up? You shouldn't talk like that, the man said to the dummy. It's not nice. I can talk if I want to, the dummy said. She can't make me stop. Joey, the girl said, I want to talk to you. Listen, let's go somewhere and talk. Shut up for a minute, the dummy said to the girl. For God's sake, will you shut up for a minute? 
people at nearby tables were beginning to turn, interested in the dummy's loud voice, and laughing already, hearing him talk. Please be quiet, the girl said. Yeah, don't make such a fuss, the man said to the dummy. I'm just going to have this one drink. She doesn't mind. He's not going to bring you any drink, the girl said impatiently. They told him not to. They wouldn't give you a drink here the way you're acting. I'm acting fine, the man said. I'm the one making the fuss, the dummy said. It's time someone told you, sweetheart. You're going to get into trouble acting like a wet blanket all the time. A man won't stand for it forever. Be quiet, the girl said, looking around her anxiously. Everyone can hear you. Let them hear me, the dummy said. He turned his grinning head around at his audience and raised his voice. Just because a man wants to have a good time, she has to freeze up like an ice bag. Now, Marmaduke, the man said to the dummy, you better talk nicer to your old mother. Why, I wouldn't tell that old bag the right time, the dummy said. If she doesn't like it here, let her get back on the streets. Mrs. Wilkins' mouth opened and shut again. She put her napkin down on the table and stood up. While Mrs. Straw watched blankly, she walked over to the other table and slapped the dummy sharply across the face. By the time she had turned and come back to her own table, Mrs. Straw had her coat on and was standing. We'll pay on the way out, Mrs. Wilkins said curtly. She picked up her coat and the two of them walked with dignity to the door. For a moment, the man and girl sat looking at the dummy slumped over sideways, its head awry. Then the girl reached over and straightened the wooden head. The sounds began in the middle of summer, in the middle of the night. Bella Winters sat up in bed at about 3 a.m. and listened and then lay back down. Ten minutes later, she heard the sounds again, out in the night, down the hill. Bella Winters lived in a first-floor apartment on top of Vendome Hills, near Effie Street in Los Angeles, and had lived there now for only a few days, so it was all new to her, this old house on an old street with an old staircase, made of concrete, climbing steeply straight up from the lowlands below. 120 steps, count them. And right now, Someone's on the steps, said Bella to herself. What? said her husband Sam in his sleep. There are some men out on the steps, said Bella, talking, yelling, not fighting, but almost. I heard them last night, too, and the night before, but... What? Sam muttered. Shh, go to sleep. I'll look. She got out of bed in the dark and went to the window, and yes, two men were indeed talking out there, grunting, groaning, now loud, now soft, and there was another noise, a kind of bumping, sliding, thumping, like a huge object being carted up the hill. No one could be moving in at this hour of night, could they? asked Bella of the darkness, the window and herself. No, murmured Sam. It sounds like... Like what? asked Sam, fully awake now. Like two men moving. Moving what, for God's sake? Moving a piano up those steps at three in the morning? A piano and two men, just listen. The husband sat up, blinking, alert. Far off in the middle of the hill, there was a kind of harping strum, the noise a piano makes when suddenly thumped and its harp strings hum. There, did you hear? Jesus, you're right. But why would anyone steal? They're not stealing, they're delivering. A piano. I didn't make the rules, Sam. Go out and ask. No, don't. I will. And she wrapped herself in her robe and was out the door and on the sidewalk. Bella, Sam whispered fiercely behind the porch screen. Crazy. So what can happen at night to a woman 55, fat and ugly, she wondered. Sam did not answer. She moved quietly to the rim of the hill. Somewhere down there, she could hear the two men wrestling with a huge object. The piano, on occasion, gave a strumming hum and fell silent. Occasionally, one of the men yelled or gave orders. The voices, said Bella. I know them from somewhere. 
She whispered and moved in utter dark on stairs that were only a long, pale ribbon going down as a voice echoed, Well, here's another fine mess you got us in. Bella froze. Where have I heard that voice, she wondered, a million times. Hello, she called. She moved, counting the steps, and stopped, and there was no one there. Suddenly, she was very cold. There was nowhere for the strangers to have gone to. The hill was steep, and a long way down, and a long way up, and they had been burdened with an upright piano, hadn't they? How come I know upright, she thought. I only heard, but... Yes, upright. Not only that, but inside a box. She turned slowly, and as she went back up the steps, one by one, slowly, slowly, the voices began to sound again, below, as if disturbed they had waited for her to go away what are you doing demanded one voice i was just said the other give me that cried the first voice that other voice thought bella i know that too and i know it's going to be said next now said the echo far down the hill in the night don't just stand there help me yes Bella closed her eyes and swallowed hard, and half fell to sit on the steps, getting her breath back as black and white pictures flashed in her head. Suddenly, it was 1929, and she was very small, in a theater with dark and light pictures looming above the first row where she sat, transfixed, and then laughing, and then transfixed and laughing again. She opened her eyes. The two voices were still down there, a faint wrestle and echo in the night, despairing and thumping each other with their hard derby hats. Zelda, thought Bella Winters. I'll call Zelda. She knows everything. She'll tell me what this is. Zelda, yes. Inside, she dialed Z and E and L and D and A before she saw what she had done and started over. The phone rang a long while until Zelda's voice, angry with sleep, spoke halfway across L.A. Zelda, this is Bella. Sam just died? No, no, I'm sorry. You're sorry. Zelda, I know you're going to think I'm crazy, but go ahead, be crazy. Zelda, in the old days when they made films around L.A., they used lots of places, right? Like Venice, Ocean Park, uh, Chaplin did, Langdon did, Harold Lloyd, sure. Laurel and Hardy? What? Laurel and Hardy, did they use lots of locations? Palms, they used palms lots. Culver City, Main Street, Effie Street. Effie Street? Don't yell, Bella. Did you say Effie Street? Sure, and God, it's three in the morning. Right at the top of Effie Street. Hey, yeah, the stairs, everyone knows them. That's where the music box chased Hardy downhill and ran over him. Sure, Zelda, sure. Oh, God, Zelda, if you could see, hear, what I hear. Zelda was suddenly wide awake on the line. What's going on? You serious? Oh, God, yes. On the steps just now. And last night, and the night before, maybe, I heard, I hear, two men hauling a, a piano up the hill. Someone's pulling your leg. No, no, they're there. I go out, and there's nothing. But the steps are haunted, Zelda. One voice says, Here's another fine mess you've got us in. You've got to hear the man's voice. You're drunk and you're doing this because you know I'm a nut for them. No, no, come, Zelda, listen, tell. Maybe half an hour later, Bella heard the old ten Lizzie rattle up the alley behind the apartments. It was a car Zelda, in her joy at visiting silent movie theaters, had bought to lug herself around in while she wrote about the past. Always the past, and steaming into Cecil B. DeMille's old place, or circling around Harold Lloyd's nation state, or cranking and banging around the Universal backlot, paying her tributes to the Phantom's opera stage, or sitting on Ma and Pa Kettle's porch chewing his sandwich lunch. That was Zelda, who once wrote in the silent country in the silent time for silver screen. Zelda lumbered across the front porch, a huge body with legs as big as the Bernini columns in front of St. Peter's in Rome, and a face like a harvest moon. On that round face now was suspicion, cynicism, skepticism, and equal pie parts. But when she saw Bella's pale stare, she cried, Bella! 
You see, I'm not lying, said Bella. I see. Keep your voice down, Zelda. Oh, it's scary and strange, terrible and nice, so come on. And the two women edged along the walk to the rim of the old hill near the old steps in old Hollywood. And suddenly, as they moved, they felt time take a half turn around them. And it was another year, because nothing had changed. All the buildings were the way they were in 1928, and the hills beyond like they were in 1926, and the steps just the way they were when the cement was poured in 1921. Listen, Zelda, there. And Zelda listened. And at first, there was only a creaking of wheels down in the dark like crickets. And then a moan of wood and hum of piano strings. And then one voice lamenting about this job. And the other voice claiming he had nothing to do with it. And then the thumps as two derby hats fell. And an exasperated voice announced, Here's another fine mess you've got us in. Zelda, stunned, almost toppled off the hill. She held tight to Bella's arm as tears brimmed in her eyes. It's a trick. Someone's got a tape recorder, or... No, I checked. Nothing but the steps, Zelda. The steps. Tears rolled down Zelda's plump cheeks. Oh, God. That is his voice. I I'm the expert. I'm the mad fanatic, Bella. That's all he... And the other voice. Stan. And you're not nuts, after all. The voices below rose and fell, and one cried, Why don't you do something to help me? Zelda moaned. Oh, God, it's so beautiful. What does it mean? Why are they here? Are they really ghosts? And why would ghosts climb this hill every night, pushing that music box, night after night? Tell me, Zelda, why? Zelda peered down the hill and shut her eyes for a moment to think. Why do any ghosts go anywhere? Retribution? Revenge? No, not these two. Loves may be the reason. Lost loves or something, yes? Bella let her heart pound once or twice and then said, Maybe nobody told them. Told them what? Or maybe they were told a lot but still didn't believe. Or maybe in their old years things got bad. I mean, they were sick. And sometimes when you're sick, you forget. Forget what? How much we loved them. They knew. Did they? Sure, we told each other, but maybe not enough of us ever rode or waved when they passed and just yelled love, you think? Hell, Bella, they're on TV every night. Yeah, but that doesn't count. Has anyone, since they left us, come here to these steps and said, maybe those voices down there, ghosts or whatever, have been here every night for years pushing that music box and nobody thought or tried to just whisper or yell all the love we had all those years. Zelda stared down into the long darkness where perhaps shadows moved, and maybe a piano lurched clumsily among the shadows. You're right. If I'm right, said Bella, and you say so, there's only one thing to do. You mean you and me? Who else? Quiet, come on. They moved down a step. In the same instant, lights came on around them, and a window here, another there. A screen door opened somewhere, and angry words shot out into the night. Hey, what's going on? Pipe down! You know what time it is? My God, Bella whispered. Everyone else hears now. No, no, Zelda looked around wildly. They'll spoil everything. I'm calling the cops, a window slammed. God, said Bella, if the cops come, what? It'll be all wrong. If anyone's going to tell them to take it easy, pipe down, it's got to be us. We care, don't we? God, yes, but no buts. Grab on. Here we go. The two voices murmured below, and the piano tuned itself with the hiccups of sound as they edged down another step and another, their mouths dry, hearts hammering, and the night so dark they could only see the faint street light at the stair bottom and the single street illumination. So far away, it was sad being there all by itself, waiting for shadows to move. More windows slammed up, more screen doors opened. At any moment, there would be an avalanche of protest, incredible outcries, perhaps shots fired, and all this gone forever. Thinking this, the women trembled and held tight, as if to pummel each other to speak against the rage. Say something, Zelda, quick! What? Anything! They'll get hurt if we don't... They? 
You know what I mean. Save them. Okay, Jesus. Zelda froze, clamped her eyes shut to find the words, then opened her eyes and said, Hello? Louder. Hello? Zelda called softly, then loudly. Shapes rustled in the dark below. One of the voices rose while the other fell, and the piano strummed its hidden harp strings. Don't be afraid, Zelda called. That's good, go on. Don't be afraid, Zelda called, braver now. Don't listen to those others yelling. We won't hurt you. It's just us. I'm Zelda. Y you wouldn't remember. And this here is Bella. And we've known you forever, or since we were kids. And we love you. It's late, but we thought you should know. We've loved you ever since you were in the desert, or on that boat with the ghosts, or trying to sell Christmas trees door to door, or in that traffic where you tore the headlights off cars. And we still love you, right, Bella? The night below was darkness, waiting. Zelda punched Bella's arm. Yes, Bella cried. What she said, we love you. We can't think of anything else to say. But it's enough, yes? Bella leaned forward anxiously. It's enough? A night wind stirred the leaves and grass around the stairs and the shadows below that had stopped moving, with the music box suspended between them as they looked up and up at the two women, who suddenly began to cry. First, tears fell from Bella's cheeks, and when Zelda sensed them, she let fall her own. So now, said Zelda, amazed that she could form words, but managed to speak anyway, we want you to know, you don't have to come back anymore. You don't have to climb the hill every night, waiting. For what we just said now is it, isn't it? I, I mean, you wanted to hear it here, on this hill, with those steps, and that piano, yes? That's the whole thing. It had to be that, didn't it? So now, here we are, and there you are, and it's said. So rest, dear friends. Oh, there, Ollie, added Bella in a sad, sad whisper. Oh, Stan... Stanley. The piano, hidden in the dark, softly hummed its wires and creaked its ancient wood. And then, the most incredible thing happened. There was a series of shouts and then a huge banging crash as the music box, in the dark, rocketed down the hill, skittering on the steps, playing chords where it hit, swerving, rushing, and ahead of it, running, the two shapes pursued by the musical beast, yelling, tripping, shouting, warning the fates, crying out to the gods, down and down, 40, 60, 80, 100 steps. And half down the steps, hearing, feeling, shouting, trying themselves, and now laughing and holding to each other, the two women alone in the night, wildly clutching, grasping, trying to see, almost sure that they did see, the three things ricocheting off and away, the two shadows rushing, one fat, one thin, and the piano blundering after, discordant and mindless, until they reached the street, where, instantly, the one overhead streetlight died as if struck, and the shadows floundered on, pursued by the musical beast. And the two women, abandoned, looked down, exhausted with laughing, until they wept and weeping until they laughed, until suddenly Zelda got a terrible look on her face as if shot. My God, she shouted in panic, reaching out. Wait, we, we didn't mean, we didn't want, don't go forever. Sure, so the neighbors here sleep, but... Once a year, once a night, a year from tonight, and every night after that, come back. It shouldn't bother anyone so much, but we got to tell you all over again, huh? Come back and bring the box with you, and we'll be waiting, won't we, Bella? Waiting, yes. There was a long silence from the steps leading down to an old black and white, silent Los Angeles. You think they heard? They listened. And from somewhere far off and down, there was the faintest explosion, like the engine of an old jalopy knocking itself to life, and then the merest whisper of a lunatic music from a dark theater when they were very young. It faded. After a long while, they climbed back up the steps, dabbing at their eyes with wet Kleenex. Then they turned for a final time to stare down into the night. You know something? said Zelda. I think they heard. 
be home. Are they up there? No, I heard them coming up the stairs. You heard them coming up. Why, stupid, that was me! That was you? Why, certainly. Well, how'd you get in the house? 